Welcome to the Spirit of Yorkshire Distillery at The Whiskey Show. Throughout the week, we'll have sessions, live chats and videos showing on our booth. For your chance to win a set of all our whiskies to date, follow the link to sign up to our newsletter. The winner of this free prize draw will be announced on Friday 9th of October at 7.30pm. We'll always be live at 2pm, 4pm and 7pm with special sessions throughout the week. Key dates for your diary are Friday the 2nd at 6.30pm, live tasting session with David and Joe. Saturday the 3rd at 4pm, we'll be in conversation with the Swedish Whiskey Girl. Saturday the 3rd at 7pm, live tasting session with David and Joe. Sunday the 4th at 4pm, we'll be talking all things malt with Munton CEO Tim and his team. Sunday 4th at 7pm, live tasting session with David and Joe. Friday the 9th of October at 5pm, discussing barrel-aged beer with Alex from Wald Top Brewery. And finally, Friday 9th of October at 7pm, rounding up and picking the winner of our free prize draw. And you can always ask us questions using the chat function. These films were part of our Field to Bottle Facebook Live series that we ran every Wednesday for 12 weeks over lockdown. They covered every aspect of our production, from field to bottle, each lasting around 30 minutes. Hi Joe, how are you doing? I'm good Jenny, good evening, how are you getting on? Yeah, not bad thank you, although you're not very happy about the fact that this sort of 30 degree weather has turned into, I mean, less than 13 degrees and just constant rain. You can see behind me it's not it's not looking particularly exciting or idyllic up here on the walls just right yeah. now. Certainly less spectacular than usual. Yeah, it is, given that this is there's a bit of a sea threat come in and it's very foggy and very cloudy and you can't see anything. Um, mm. Yeah, not ideal. I prefer sunshine, if I'm honest. Um, okay, so uh, welcome everybody to Field to Bottle number five. Can you believe it? We're into our fifth week of this, and this week we're looking at distillery projects 005 and 006. So we've got a few people who've joined us already. I can see uh, I can see the numbers ticking up on the top of the screen. Uh, so we'll just give it another few seconds uh, before we get going good and proper. Great. Great. So, uh, good day today, Joe. Yeah, really good actually. Yeah, really good. Um, as as kind of usual, just working on upcoming uh, releases. So yeah, been it's been a it's been a busy old day. The dress is getting very full. It is getting very full. Just look at it back there. How's, uh, uh, how's that going down in your house? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think the yeah I had I think I had billed this as just being like a two week thing. Do you know what I mean? I was like, yeah, no, it'll be okay. You know, you'll get, get all the photos back in a couple of weeks and trinkets and whatnot. And uh, yeah, just keep adding whiskey, basically. So, yeah. I, I, think it, I think it's great use of a dresser, you know? 
yeah I'm not sure I think I may be maybe on M side there. It's, <laughs> it's just how things go isn't it um okay, so my internet is being a bit flickery but I'm going to put that down to the fact that I'm in the middle of nowhere and it's raining which is always pretty bad for wi-fi signal up here so so bear with us if things just if things happen to flicker a little bit right we've got a few people on now so I think let's let's get going so hello Paul he's one of our cask owners a very good friend of the distillery and Diane he's uh, one of the team members as well so yeah we've definitely got a few people watching now so right so let's get going so without further ado welcome to Fields Bottle number five uh, I'm Jenny. I head up the marketing spirit of Yorkshire Distillery. I'm less interesting. I'm sort of here just to ask questions and keep things moving. The most interesting person on this, though, is Joe Clark, who's the whiskey director. And uh, today we're going to be talking about our distillery projects 005 and 006, which were single cask maturing malts. And they were the last things that we released last summer before, drumroll, we had our first ever single malt whiskey. So they were a pretty big deal. Yeah, Joe? Yeah, for sure. You know, I can't believe these, we bottled these a year ago. To me, in June last year. It feels like no time at all, and yet it feels like everything is different. I still can't quite believe yeah. that it's been a year since we released the whiskey. Yeah, for sure. It is. It's really quite great. It's been really nice revisiting these actually over the past few weeks. Because, um, yeah, you know, it's, you know, obviously how the how the whiskey's progressed and what we're taking to bottle and how the warehouse is changing and all that kind of thing. Um, but also just where where we were at as you know as, as a team of people working together as well um you know and yeah that's that's been a quick year <laughs> it's definitely been a fast year um so yeah i guess on onto the onto the the whiskey or the maturing malt as it was then and uh yeah these were the, the last two bottles in the set of distillery projects maturing malts that we did so um yeah the previous weeks we talked about one and two and three and four um, this week, obviously, 005 and 006 that we've got here. Um, so I'll do a quick overview on the range. Um, I think it's probably worth, if anyone's not familiar um, with what they're all about. Um, you know, sadly, you can't buy these now. These 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 have gone. These are lost to the, the pages of uh, whiskey history for us. Um, but, yeah, early on from um, – it was December – uh, just after we'd opened in Easter uh, 2017, so yeah, December 2017, we started uh, bottling some some young aged uh, spirit that we'd laid down, um, and yeah, they were they were getting really popular. There's was, was a few different reasons that we did it. I'm not going to go exactly into that right now because uh, we've done that in previous videos. You can always skip back, but you know, they were really uh, really about you know making sure that you know people could a see what was happening um and the, the kind of getting a little a little bit of insight into the whiskey we were we were making or that would, would be coming um crucially you know it gave something uh for people to 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 pick up when they were with us and they came to visit the distillery um you know we we weren't a distillery that that did white spirits early on you know so we you know we we took the decision to bottle some some pre-whiskey um which is pretty brave not a lot of distilleries have done that um if they do do it they don't often shout about it. Um, so yeah, we, we we started a series of bottlings and the two that we've got here are at the tail end of this. So this was five and six. Um, we bottled these in June last year um, and they were, yeah, they were the kind of the last kind of kind of bottlings in this series before we, we kicked off with the with the whiskey with the Filey Bay single malt, which came in the October of that year. Um, so yeah, the 05, have you got a glass, Jen? somewhere <laughs> i think i've lost your sound as well you're muted aren't you um, yeah there. i'm back on sorry um i'm having a bit of tech fail up at this end um no I don't, I don't have a glass with me uh mainly because i don't have an open bottle of 05 and 06 and the only ones that we do have up on the farm i've been told under no circumstances am i allowed to open mm -hmm. because they are exceptionally precious to yeah. both alex and tom mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a fair, and that's a very fair statement. There certainly wasn't a lot of this. So, whereas with the other bottlings, they were marriages of, of, of casks, typically about five casks, uh, yielding around two thousand bottles for each of the others. Whereas, uh, whereas with these, you know, big difference was they were single cask. Um, and yeah, we dropped them into a smaller bottle size. Um, and yeah, with any single cask uh, release, you're talking a very, very small number of bottles yielded from that individual uh, cask. So. 
yeah, in the case of this, it's 549 bottles. And uh, yeah, they're, 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 they're like hen's teeth now, you know? So I'm not surprised you're not allowed to open them, to be honest. I mean, yeah, you could just... Uh, it was some poor planning for me. I just assumed there'd be a bottle open somewhere. I should have gone down to the distillery and seen if I could sort of steal, yeah, a, sure. steal a, a sample from somewhere. Um, but yeah. no, that, that's the thing. So especially 005, of which there was 544, is that correct? And yeah. we had a few outside the distillery uh, at 7.30 a.m. Mm -hmm. that morning. And um, and we had quite a few phone calls from people uh, from further afield. So so we released it as a, a fully distillery exclusive, so only available at the distillery um, in person. And we had some interesting phone calls from people sort of attempting to bribe staff in order to get them to post a bottle mm -hmm. out to them. It was, it was it was a bit surreal and quite, quite, quite yeah. fun on one side. Yeah, yeah, it turned, it turned out that yeah they, they 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 were a massive hit you know yeah we were just talking a little bit before this we weren't going to try and kind of kind of push that part of it too hard but they but they really they really were yeah to have it to have a queue about 40 people deep outside the distillery on the day that you put them out um you know when it's not even whiskey yet was was really amazing um if anyone's if anyone's tuned in that came out for that queue you know, well played. <laughs> and if you happen to have a bottle and you feel like opening it, you know, now's the time to do it. Um, because it is really, really tasty stuff. Um, so yeah, it was a, a single cast, the cask in question. So we talked about these uh in the previous weeks, which um which are happy to go over again, which is uh the STR wine cask that we filled. Um so this was this was a single STR wine barrel. Um uh with the S standing for shave, the T standing for toasted and the R standing for rechard so shave toasted rechard um and that process is really about kind of reconditioning the cask so it's uh suitable for for, for kind of long term um a nice balanced maturation of whiskey uh, as opposed to just fill it you know if it didn't do that that process hadn't happened and you just kind of emptied out the wine filled our spirit straight in uh, the, the the wine would very quickly overwhelm um, the, the character of our new make. So, you know, this reconditioning process is about making the cask much kind of better suited for whiskey maturation. They're absolutely stunning casks. And, you know, this really, really proves it. Um, and, yeah, so so one, one single STR cask, and it is super, super fruity stuff. Um, so when we bottled these, we, we, you know, normally with single cast whiskies, you might expect to see them at cast strength. That's fairly typical. Um, you know, some bottlers might take them down to 50. They're usually at a higher percentage. But I mean, we, we took the decision to take these down to 46 because they are still very young. Um, you know, the, the, the kind of spirit in question here, um, yeah, about kind of two and a half years old at this point. So, you know, it did benefit really quite dramatically from being cut back to 46. Um, as opposed to a kind of full strength, which would have been around kind of 61 when we did these. Um, but yeah, it's really kind of, you know, very, very, very obviously fruity. You know, we talk about fruit in whiskey. Sometimes it can be a little bit subdued. Some people don't get it. But if you get your nose in a glass of this, it really is a lot of red fruit um, and a lot of kind of raspberry. Uh, that kind of that kind of dark kind of berries, you know, the kind of um, uh, kind of kind of summer fruit cheesecake, you know, the kind of intense layer of kind of fruity jammy stuff that you get on top of a cheesecake. It's that kind of thing. Yeah, I remember there's quite a lot of like honey notes in there as well. There was some, yeah, it was really, yeah. really deep. Yeah, lots of interesting flavours. Um, so we've got our first comment that's just come in. So here you go, Joe. So based on what you know so far, can you estimate when the STR will be at its peak? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, I, I, I wouldn't want to stick my neck, neck out and say, you know, at any given year, this will certainly be its best. You still have, um, you still have, uh, you know, nuances between each barrel, you know, so it isn't always black and white. And sometimes they can uh, be quite surprising just how, how far the, the kind of the, some, some can advance a bit quicker than others. Um, but you know, I think a lot of these casks are going to be really. I mean, I mean, this was this was exceptional at two and a half years old, to be honest. But there, there's a lot of these casks that we've laid down. I say a lot; it's quite a small percentage of our overall warehouse. But you know, some of them are tasting fantastic already at kind of three, three and a half years. And I'd, I'd like to say some of these will really come into their own six to eight years. Um, we'll see if anyone's tuning look, looks back on this video in. Uh, 
yeah, kind of five years time can hold me to that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. So that's the STR one. Um, so we talked about the Rioja STR casks. So they're, they're from Spain. I had a mind blank yeah. earlier and I asked where Rioja came from. Uh, but obviously that's come from Spain. And um, can, is there anything else we should know about those casks that you think might be interesting? I think that it's worth bearing in mind that they're quite a new type of cask. They were championed, uh, pioneered by a chap called Dr. Jim Swan, who we worked with very, very closely setting up Spirit of Yorkshire. So, um, you know, he was really at the forefront of this cask type. Um, indeed, work, working with uh, the cooperage that we work with now, um, which is Jose Miguel Martin. And, uh, you know, the cast, the cast from, from, from Miguel and his team are just absolutely top notch. You know, they're, they, you know, they they really are some of the very, very best casks you'll get in the whiskey industry. Um, and the STR angle on that, yeah, in terms of, in terms of whiskey maturation is quite a new one. Um, so yeah, it's quite, it's an advanced, I would say it's an advanced type of cask used in, in the industry and certainly not that common in the grand scheme of the industry. Okay. Great. So if we move on to uh, 006, so what, what made 006 different from 005? Um, so straight away, um, a completely different type of cask. Um, so the 06 was a much bigger cask, and this was a, a sherry butt. So the, the, the STR there is what, a 220 litre uh, kind of wine barrique, whereas, yeah, the uh, Fino cask in question here, uh, Sherry Butt, and that was that was kind of 500 litre capacity in that cask. So these these are big big casks, and um, if any of you have been to the distillery or if you're planning to come and have a look, um, then yeah, you know you'll see we've got some Sherry Butts down on the distillery uh, floor. Um, so yeah, they're big big casks, and so obviously with a bigger cask, bigger yield of bottles. So we're looking at 1,142. Uh, bottles that were yielded from this particular cask, and again, this was not this was taken back to forty six percent alcohol, um, and it is a fifty cl bottle, of course. So you know, it's, it was it was a good yield of bottles from the cask, um, and obviously with slightly more bottles, the kind of the frenzied rush to get them wasn't quite as rapid as it was for the for the O five. Um, so yeah, the cask was very different, the size of the cask, um, and as you might expect, the, the flavour is completely different as well. So. You know, it's really nice having them side by side. If you're in a privileged position like I am right now, you've got the two side by side. Um, you know, this is that kind of really upfront, really, really super fruity style. Um, whereas this is um, a little bit more subdued, a bit lighter, but it's kind of spicier, a bit more elegant. It, it's arguably of the two, it's probably um, for, for me a little bit more entertaining because it'll make you work a bit harder to kind of pull the flavors out of it um it's not as kind of in your face as this even though as lovely as that is this is a little bit um kind of yeah a little bit more mysterious it's got a bit more kind of um depth is perhaps the wrong word um because it isn't as rich but it's certainly got um yeah kind of a, a few more strings to its bow in terms of layers of flavor yeah, I really like the kind of the tropical -y type fruits that you come through on this one. So things like the the what's the word pineapple, that kind of thing. That just mm -hmm. it felt really nice, very summery, really good for a not 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 that it's almost yeah, not that it's too much, but it just, it felt like a really nice summery drink. Mhm. Mm it has a really nice kind of uh, like um, iciness to it as well. Um, so there's a lovely kind of gingery. Um, and kind of like that kind of sweet spices, um, kind of sweet baking spices. And yeah, you've got this lovely, I remember talking about this quite a lot when we launched it and we're tasting it with people, but after you've swallowed it and you're just kind of breathing and out a little bit just after you've swallowed it, you've got this lovely, lovely lift of uh, coconut and a slight kind of really, really light chocolatey note as well, um, which just kind of kind of just rushes through your, through your, through your senses. And it's really... Um, yeah, really interesting. And, you know, I suppose looking at the age, you know, it's two and a half years old um, and the type of cask as well, you know, you certainly, you know, you certainly wouldn't expect it to be drinking like this. You know, I don't think anybody looking through a warehouse of casks and seeing that at two and a half years would expect this kind of flavour profile at that age. 
Um, they, they really were exceptional. Um, there's no doubt about it. The selection process on them was very, very thorough, obviously. Um, they actually, the kind of piece of work undertaking at, at this particular time was, remember, I was going through, I was going through every, all our 2016 f uh, fillings. I don't know if you remember that, Jen, because I was really yeah. hard to get hold of. Yeah, and trying to get pacing notes off you and things like that for label yeah. was, was hard work. It was kind of up in a, it was, actually, it was quite cold as well. I remember being up at the warehouse and the farm, kind of really cold, but just, you know, going methodically working through, working through all the, all the kind of fillings from that year. Um, so, you know, it was, it was really, really amazing, you know, because when you're doing a piece of work like that, you get to know, you know, you get to know the warehouse really well. You get to know our whiskey really, really well, obviously. Um, and yeah, you know, being able to kind of cherry pick these two out of all of those casts that we filled was really amazing. Um, Actually, yeah. that leads really well. Sorry, that leads really neatly into a question that's just come in, and also something I was going to ask about as well, which is: so the question is why why a fino? Um, and not a PX or Oloroso. And then actually, if you follow that up about kind of what made each of these casks so so special. So we had cask 109 for, for 005 and cask 104 for 006. So why those specific casks? And those, that was um, well, I guess, as well. Yeah, sure. So um, and why Fino? Um, you know, kind of, that's like quite easy, but why not? Um, yeah, we filled we filled quite a few different types of sherry casks um, early on, um, you know, and it, it was kind of you know what's going to work well um, with our style of, of whiskey that we're making. You know, the style of whiskey if you if you if you've been through kind of first release, second release, um, super light, you know, really kind of delicate light style that we've got, and you know you've got to be careful that you're not using casks that are going to kind of really overwhelm that. So the fino cask in terms of a, in terms of a, a, a style of sherry uh, is much lighter and much drier. Um, Oloroso, uh, technically a dry style as well, but is certainly packing more kind of fruit um, and, and will certainly give you a lot kind of deeper, richer flavors. Um, and PX is kind of a, even a step beyond that. Um, now, we do have, and we did have alongside these kind of sister casts of PX and Oloroso, um, but they, they're kind of, they just needed a bit more time, to be honest with you. They, they're, I mean, they're tasting really good. They're still, you know, really, really interesting flavor wise. Um, but I think the, this this just really not only not only did it let the distillery character still shine through, which is always really important in any of the bottlings that we're doing. You know, we want to make sure that that distillery character is 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 in that in that background uh, at the very least, if not right in the forefront. And you know that that allowed it. It gave that nice balance. And you know, good good whiskey, or in this case, maturing malt for me, is always about balance. You know, and you've got to be able to kind of you know not just wood and not just kind of too much too much kind of heavy hitting uh, sherry because with that for me you know you lose the you lose the distillery dna in that um so yeah we we you know off the back of of these early fillings that we did we've committed more spirit to female sherry casks and you know they're really really stunning you know they're really beautiful balanced flavor that you get from them um and there was another part to that question was there another part um yes there was but actually another question has just come in which actually i think leads neatly into that follows neatly on from what you're saying and then we can address the other part of the question after that so yeah. uh the next bit of the question which has come in is so would you use a fino as a finishing task at some stage yeah for sure yeah 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 you know we've um you know we've got a lot of a lot to think about in terms of in terms of finishing um there's obviously we've done the moscatel release um the the you know the potential with it is huge you know you can create really beautiful layers of flavor you can do some really make some really beautiful whiskey um would would fino be a great part of that you know yeah potentially um so yeah it's certainly certainly not off the cards at all um you know at the moment the fino we've got is 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 kind of largely full term so um you know yeah so it's not it's kind of not on the not on the plan right now <laughs> but certainly not off the table. Okay, so the next part of the question that I was we were going to talk about was the specific cask numbers. I think you've probably addressed this already, but it might just be worth covering over. But what was it that made cask number 109 and cask number 104 just really stand out when you were doing the, that kind of long week of tasting and sampling? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, mo most people that are familiar with what we're doing and the whiskey we're making will know that, you know, the pr predominant cask type that we lay down is first full bourbon. Um, so the, you know the reason for this being that you know that is that's the kind of backbone of our distillery style. It works really, really well with our spirit, and you know there are other reasons as well. 
Um, but that, that's the bulk of what we're filling. So when you're going through a piece of work on, on in terms of long-term sampling and tasting, you know, you're going through a lot of bourbon barrels. Um, so, you know, they stand out immediately simply because they're so different to the, to the main cast type that we're doing. Within that, you know, they have sister casks. You know, we didn't just fill these casks in isolation. They were filled along other, other side, uh, filled alongside, sorry, um, uh, uh, you know, other sherry casks or other, other STRs. So, um, you know, this was actually, this was, this was part of a group of, of 10 casks that were filled um, you know, back in uh, October 16. Uh, I can remember them. I can remember them being on the warehouse floor. So, uh, so Tom and Dave had just filled these probably about maybe maybe as soon as about two weeks before I started uh, with Spirit of Yorkshire. And so they were sitting on the warehouse floor. I can remember us kind of checking them out over the kind of few weeks that they were sat down there. Um, and the, these 10 STR casks um, were really instrumental in this early distillery projects range. So, you know, of those 10 that we filled then, um, you know, they've, they've actually – formed yeah so one went into uh, 01 one went into 02 one went into 03 two went into 04 um one here so you know this was this was part of a group of just four um i remember it was sitting alongside 115 111 110 and this was card 109 and it was a really it was like splitting hairs when it came to this one on 115 um they were super super close um the 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 thing that clinched it for this was actually it just had a it just had a brighter nose when it was at 46 the aroma profile of the nose was just more pronounced um and it, it just lured you in a bit more and a bit quicker to 115 um it's quite interesting you get to know the cast really well you know as you probably gather um and 106 uh, had a sister uh, which was 105 um which is which is still doing its thing at the moment and it's still tasting really great that was again it was hard but that was a slightly easier decision to make um this 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 particular pheno but just had uh just had that depth and it just kept going and and you know the the, the flavors on the back end were really interesting you know and it kept that it kept you really engaged whether whereas it's it's siblings either side of it were well, again were still good and interesting but they were you know, they were just, they weren't quite as well balanced. It's, you know, again, it's, I'm coming back to balance on this because they were, you know, they actually, it was, I think it was 105, it had a much bigger nose than this, you know, and you kind of go, wow, that's the one. But then when you start really working through it and tasting and taking your time with it, um, you go, actually, that's better balanced. It had the layers of flavor running through it, which, you know, is, is for me, all, and indeed anybody who enjoys complicated, delicious spirit is really important. You know, it needs to have layers of flavour. <laughs> Great. Uh, so yes. we talk a bit more about where we get our Fino you know, casks from. So something that's come out since we've been, we did the Moscatel one, we had, there was a couple of people on Twitter kind of debating whether we really could say sherry or not, or whether we did that or not. So it'd be good, good opportunity to talk a bit more about our casks and, and where they're from in Spain. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, so our, our, our kind of uh, casks, all our, all our casks from, uh spain coming from a chap called uh miguel martin and he's arguably you know the the kind of it's a bit unfair i don't want to say the, the best out there because there's low there's you know there's obviously brilliant alternatives you know but miguel's cast are just superb um you know i know there's a lot of other distilleries that would, that would pay testament to that um he's well suited for for kind of production for making making casks and supporting the whiskey industry through the casks that he makes um and yeah yeah that's really important you know there's so there's just so much rides on 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 the wood and you know you've got to get the the best casks for for you uh, for your distillery and for the whiskey you're trying to make um now i know dave's going to go more into wood in, in a later one of these and and i'm sure he'll tell you the tales of him out in spain um enjoying more than a, two or three glasses of sherry i'm sure um with with miguel and the guys out there but um but yeah you know it's 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 interesting because yeah you've got you've got a kind of wide spectrum of of, of producers obviously you've got um yeah you know kind of fortified wine casts outside of that which up until i think it was as recent as as really kind of 2014 you know it was really only then that there was a kind of definitive look you know if you if you're saying sherry cast it's got to be from this specific 
uh, kind of accredited makers of sherry, of course, which Miguel is one of. So, um, you know, so it's un undisputed um, that they're sherry cast. The Moscatel ones are really interesting as well because, of course, Moscatel is a, generally a, a sweet white wine, and that won't just be made in the sherry region of Spain, but it will also come from, from other places like Portugal or Italy. Um, but yeah, in, in the case of us and the cast that we're using, um, which aren't coming from the US at the moment, we source them from from Jerez, from Miguel, um, and they are absolutely stunning, doing really, really great stuff for our whiskey. Brilliant. And for everyone, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so, so a slightly more lighthearted question. Uh, do you struggle to do the paperwork and drive home after you've been testing casks? <laughs> So it's a very valid question. Um, I'm incredibly responsible, obviously. Um, I mean, you know, not driving so much recently has allowed me to, to, to do more kind of tasting work than I would typically do in a normal working day. Um, normally, if I'm, if I'm up at the warehouse, you know, it's a case of it's all about nosing, really. That's the kind of principal uh, starting point with all of them. Um, and, you know, if I'm doing a big day of sampling, I'll just stay over. It's really easy. Um, and, you know, if I'm looking to kind of do a lot more kind of tasting work, work and that kind of thing, I'll tend to do it from here. Um, so, yeah, I, the, the paperwork, uh, paperwork is just a struggle anyway, regardless oh, of anyway. Uh, whether the whiskey you're tasting or not tasting. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good, if not getting better. <laughs> no, you're getting better. You definitely are. I think me and India can both attest to that. Um, good. Okay, well, so we're, we're nearly up at about 30 minutes, which tends to be where we aim to uh, keep things at. Um, there's a couple more comments that I'll just pull out. So uh, one from Jason, he's one of our friends of the distillery, but from he's in the US. Um, and we've been back and forth with him quite recently about how we can get bottles to the US. And unfortunately, we don't have the system set up yet. But he is saying that he's managed to get through some through the, the lovely chap at Stanford Bridge, whiskey.co.uk. That's great. Um, I don't know that there's a couple of other people who may be interested in that. So um, hopefully, hopefully you're watching and you can see that that's happening there. Um, also, good to know that uh, David, our co-founder, said even he only has one each of uh, of the 005 and 006. So it really was hard to get hold of. And I think when when we don't have multiple bottles at home, that really does prove that it was it was extremely limited. Um, mm -hmm. So. Uh, Oh, good question that's just come in here. So when and what is the next release? Uh, it hasn't already been asked, and we haven't told anyone, uh, and we're still not going to tell anyone. But no, we're keeping that very close to our chest now. Pardon? So we're keeping that quite close to our chest, if not very close to our chest. But, uh, you know, it's tasting good. It is. There are lots of, there are lots of things. We've got some <laughs> pointing at some sample bottles. <laughs> but which one? There's hundreds. Um, yeah, we've got lots of uh, interesting things coming up in the pipeline, especially for the latter half of the year. So uh, so there'll be much more about that. And then that very neatly segues, <laughs> segues into the newsletter. Um, so if you'd like to hear more about the distillery in general, every month we do a newsletter that's very chatty, full of lots of news, different different things. We try and include content in there as well that hasn't been released on social channels before either. So you really do get the, to be the first to know. Um, and the crucial thing about the newsletter is that we always open all of our releases up to our newsletter subscribers uh, prior to the general public knowing about them. So for things like this, uh, the, the 005 and 006 releases, that went out for, um, <laughs> sorry, I've just seen a comment. I'll just tell you what that is in a second. Uh, all of uh, all the newsletter subscribers got early access and pre-order access to um, uh, to 005 and 006 first. Um, sorry, I'm being very distracted by the comments. So uh, that previous comment about the next release was just followed up by the same chap asking if it will be ready for his birthday. But unfortunately, I have no idea. Uh, but maybe. Um, and then other things just to do a quick plug for. Uh, of course, we've got our Moscatel finish. Um, which is going really well on the website. And if you haven't got, a, uh, haven't got hold of it just yet, uh, you can do so via our website. And we have a really quite special offer on at the moment, which um, is basically because we're missing having people at the distillery so much, is that for when um, things resume back to normal and we're able to welcome people back to the distillery for tours, we've said that for every, uh, if you buy two or more bottles on the website for a limited period of time, then, um, 
then you'll be able to get a tour voucher, a complimentary tour voucher for two people. Uh, sorry, everyone is just getting distracted, distracting me in the comments about when their birthdays are. Um, but thanks for letting everyone, everyone for letting us know those things. We'll, we'll keep those in mind for our product plans coming up. Um, and then the last, last thing that I just wanted to mention, because we're over our usual time now, is that uh, we've just, we well, Father's Day is three weeks away. So we're going to be launching a few things over the next week or so that are specific to Father's Day. No new products, I'm afraid, but a couple of kind of collection sets and different ways that you can order that might make it really special for your dad or your sort of the father figure who you might want to buy something for. Um, the first one of which has just gone live on our website, and that's called the Outdoors Collection, the Filey Bay Outdoors Collection. Um, and it's a bottle of Filey Bay second release, uh, an Aspinalls of London hip flask that has a really beautiful spirit of Yorkshire engraving on the mm. top. Um, some very exciting whiskey hearts that have been made, chocolate whiskey hearts that have been made by Bullion Craft Chocolate in Sheffield. And if you've been to any of our tastings or our open day before, you'll know that Bullion Chocolate is absolutely outstanding. And they've made these whiskey caramels using Filey Bay second release. Um, and we'll also, for every uh, pack that's purchased, we'll also be donating five pounds to the RSP, P, RSPB reserve uh, at Bempton Cliffs, which is the home of our distillery mascot, which is the Gannet. So that's now available on the website. It's a hundred pounds for that full set, um, which we think is really nice, a nice deal and, um, and definitely one for the summer months as people are able to spend more and more time outside. Uh, so if any other questions coming in, or Joe, is there anything else you wanted to just mention as a, as a last signing um, off on? I've got one kind of ultimate gift for Father's Day, which is of course a cask of whiskey. <laughs> um, which I feel there's still still a handful available. Um, so yeah, you know, if you like the idea of owning a cask, you know, get in touch. Um, I, you know, I'm sure any father would like one of those. <laughs> be a very nice child <laughs> to do that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I won't be getting one for my dad, just to be clear, in case he's watching. No, I'm going to get one for my dad either, but I don't think he would. Really <laughs> does he? I might be going against the grain. Um, Okay, doke. I think uh, looking at the comments, that seems to be just about everything, or it just seems to be descending into different things now anyway. Uh, so without further ado, I think we'll leave it there for this week and say uh, say see you see you next week when we'll be talking all about casks and maturation for our sixth field to bottle. All right. Yes. Hi David, how are you doing? Hi Jenny, I'm fine, thank you. Good. How's the distillery been today? Uh, wet, windy, uh, but busy, always busy. Yeah, that's great. Um, lots of, you've had the stills running today, haven't you? Or no? No, not today. No, <laughs> it's day and actually quite um, poignant because we've had our uh, next delivery of um, Spanish oak, so Spanish wood. So we can talk about that in, in more detail in a minute. Yeah, excellent. Right, well, we've got a couple of people coming in, a couple of eyeballs that I can see in the top of the screen. So we'll just chat a little bit longer um just as we get a few more people and then uh, and then i guess you can start by telling us a bit more about some of those deliveries that have arrived today um yeah it's looking good in the distillery actually yeah Lots of all the different colors yeah it's actually quite uh nice sitting here amongst my babies but uh <laughs> a small proportion of them you know these these are just what we're working on at this moment in time and uh, the majority are stored uh, back at the farm so you know um there's lots of exciting things going on down here, but there's uh, an awful lot of casks kicking about now. No, I saw a lot of casks coming up to the farm the other day and thought that looked like a very exciting day back and forth between the distillery and the farm. Yeah, it is, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Well, we're getting a few more eyeballs now, so I think we'll get going good and proper. So uh, welcome to Fields of Bottle number six. We're in our sixth week, can you believe it? Uh, this week, we are talking about maturation and wood which is a really crucial part of, uh, of the whiskey making process because frankly, it's, it's, it's where the majority of the flavor and character comes from. Uh, so I'm Jenny, I head up the marketing here at the Spirit of Yorkshire Distillery and I'm gonna be talking about maturation and wood today with David, who's one of our co-founders or one of our two co-founders, David. He's down at the distillery, I'm up at the farm. I'm gonna talk a bit to start with, but mostly it's gonna be David talking today and I'll just be kind of throwing in questions here and there and asking, um, things and keeping an eye on any comments that you put in so if you do have any comments or any questions or anything you'd like to ask just bob them into the comment section just below um, just below the screen here 
and uh, we'll pick them up and sort of answer them at the time if it's relevant and if it fits, or or we'll wait until later on in the in the um, in the broadcast to do that. So so please do put them in, and we will definitely get them answered. And if we can't answer them now and then, we'll now straight away we will drop you an email later. Okay, so without further ado, Dave, let's let's chat about wood. So why why is wood crucial to whiskey? It's incredibly cr crucial to whiskey. Um, I think for me as well, it, it's very close to my heart because uh, when we first started the process of building distillery, I actually uh, had the fantastic job of trying to find the supply of, of uh, casks. Um, so that led me uh, a little bit around the world and uh, it was a very exciting time meeting new people. Um, but uh, as you rightly say, it's a crucial part of uh, making whiskey and you've got to get this bit absolutely nailed and right. Um, so yeah, I mean the, the wood itself is so important because it, it, there's lots of substances in wood to start with, and particularly oak, which we're going to talk about. Uh, there's esters, there's tannins, there's uh, lactones. There's all sorts of uh, uh, substances that add flavour into the wood, and um, the wood itself really is a little masterpiece, or a barrel is a masterpiece of craftsmanship, and still made by hand. And all our um, suppliers still uh, process all their barrels by hand, which is very exciting to watch. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's not like just cutting down a tree and making a barrel out of it. It's the tree's got to be cut in a certain way. Um, you're probably all aware of the growth rings around the tree, um, uh, but there are also vessels that run up and down the tree. And if you uh, make a barrel with those going to the outside of the barrel, you'll lose a lot of flavour. You lose a lot of spirit. Uh, straight out of the wood. So um, being able to cut those stays or those planks in the right way is is, is super important and the first process really. And so what type of wood? Can you use any wood to make a whiskey barrel or, or is it specific? Um, no, it is very specific. I mean, to make whiskey, it has to be oak. Um, there are people trying other things for different spirits, but fundamentally uh, hardwoods like uh, oak don't have any resins uh, in them. Uh, softwoods do. So if you start to use softwoods, uh, all those pores and, and the ability for that cask to breathe is very limited, and it will throw all sorts of very strange flavors into the actual, uh, into the actual barrel and then into the, uh, the actual spirit. So, um, so there's, there's two fundamental varieties of uh, oak that we use. There's uh, American white oak, and for the nerds out there, that's... Um, <laughs> it's Quercus alba, and there's also uh, Quercus roba, which is European oak. Um, they are, again, fundamentally different in, first of all, the way they grow. Uh, the American white oak will grow uh, to full uh, maturity in about 70 to 75 years, whereas the European oak takes an awful lot longer. Um, but the American oak has got a very tight grain, um, and that makes much better barrels, more, more watertight, and, or spirit-tight barrels, I should say. Whereas the, um, the Quercus Rover is very much more porous. So you don't tend to get nowadays much uh, European oak. Um, the majority, I would say 80% of the oak out there now is American uh, white oak. Um, and that's basically uh, where the Alberban supply comes from. Yeah. So, um, so how. So we talked a bit about the, sorry, I'm just trying to form the question right in my head. So we talked a bit about the difference in, in the variety. So once, so trees being cut down, yeah. how, how do we go from basically being a tree in a wood to yeah. becoming a barrel or becoming a cask? Yeah, well, um, there's a very important stage that the wood has to go through, and that's a, a drying process. We, we, we're trying to get the wood down to around about 10% residual moisture. Um, at that stage, the wood is now um, uh, able to be made into a, into a cask. Uh, one of the problems with that is it takes time, and if it's sun-dried or air-dried, that could be up to th between three and five years. So uh, it's a bit like whiskey, you know, you've got to mature your oak. Um, so it's a long process, and again, a lot of ours is air-dried uh, or naturally dried um, before we even, even touch them before they make barrels. Um, so those air dried um, staves, if you like, then have to be bent. And the only way to bend them is to heat them back up. Uh, and this does two things. It gives them more flexibility. Uh, so you can actually get them into a, a stave shape. There's, there's one example there. You can see the bow in it. And obviously you have to have that to make a barrel. Um, but also, and this is the most important part of the flavor, 
it starts to make or activate that wood. So all those the substances inside the wood are now activated for the spirit to work with and pull flavour from. Um, and all those flavours tend to be um, vanilla-based flavours. Um, yes, there's a wood, wood element to it, but certainly vanilla and lots of sugar, and lots, lots of caramelisation of that, uh, that wood. Um, so we've got an active layer now, which is exactly what we need uh, to move on to the next stage, which is to make the barrel. And so how do you go about making the barrel? So you've got those staves, do you just glue them together, stick them together and that's it? Uh, well, there's no sticking. <laughs> so uh, everything is barrel, there's no glue. Um, in, fa in fact, you know, uh, in America, I think they can use glue, but uh, one of the stipulations of making whiskey in, in Europe and, and certainly in the UK and England is that it has to be a natural, uh, natural barrel. So there is no glue, it's just held together by the bands or the hoops you can see behind me. Usually there's up to six to seven, eight on, on a cask. Um, and as that uh, cask is being formed, they get slipped over the top. Um, so it's not just straight edge against straight edge. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a chafer to it. So um, as those come together, they form a very tight outer uh, outer layer and that that seals very very tight as we uh, start to hit those hoops down um, and one thing we do do when we uh, freshly arrive is make sure those hoops are in place um, and actually we've got some pictures Jenny if you want to just pop up uh, the picture yeah. with uh, Harry can you find that one yeah. there yeah. you go so that's my son <laughs> very hard working son when we first started uh, the distillery um, he uh, is leaning up against what we call a sherry uh, butt. So that's the biggest of our casks. He's not a small bloke. That's a big cask. No, he really isn't. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's true. So, uh, and if you look behind, you can see some casks that have got a black wrap on them. So these are some of the very first sherry casks we bought. And uh, that particular year in 2016 uh, is incredibly hot in Seville, where we get them from. So to maintain the moisture in that wood and maintain that, that shape, uh, they, they wrap them to keep the moisture in, uh, in there. If they didn't do that, then the hoops would actually uh, fall off the drying barrel. So um, that, that was quite an interesting sort of learning curve for us when they first arrived. We had to put them back together effectively. Yeah, so actually, interestingly, we um, have got some behind-the-scenes films that Dave's been doing over the past couple of weeks um and they'll be going out on our social channels and we've got one of them is about the um the hoop driver i love all the terms that you have for the pieces of equipment in the distillery so we've got one come up yesterday that was about the valanche and uh and upcoming is um both the bunk bung extractor and the hoop driver which i think just are like brilliant names and they sound like someone's just made them up but they're, they're definitely crucial pieces of kit they are certainly yeah um, and I think we've got a picture of uh, next gen of the, the different sizes of barrel yeah. and casks and, and how they influence flavour as well. So if we start with a big boy, that was the one that Harry was leaning against. And uh, that, that holds 5,000, it's not 5,000, 500 litres. I wish it did. 500 litres. Um, and that's called a butt, so a sherry butt. The, the middle one um, is a hogshead. Um, so that holds about 250 litres. The next one to the left of that is a bourbon, ex-bourbon, what they call a standard, uh, American standard barrel, and that's 200 litres. And then we made a little baby one down there. We've got three of these, just really for display. Um, and they're made out of a, a, bourbon, a bourbon barrel. Um, so they hold about 30 litres. Um, and the different cast sizes are also really fundamental to how quick uh, the whiskey matures. Uh, if you think about the surface area in the small cask per litre uh, is considerably higher than the surface area uh, per litre of the big cask. So little casks will mature very quick. Big casks will take their time. Um, and actually, uh, the speed of the small ones is too quick. So we end up with what we call an overcooked uh, or, or um, overmature uh, spirit before it has time to, to really settle down. So um, any of the small cash you come across tend to be very young. Uh, the bigger ones tend to be quite old. Okay, so um, I think if we go, before we kind of go, I was gonna ask a question about something, but I think actually let's take a step back. So um, I'm gonna put up a picture of a tree now. 
Okay, a tree. We've been talking about wood and and kind of in its most basic form, obviously we all know what a tree looks like, um, but this isn't just any tree, this is quite special for us. It is, yeah, that is a Yorkshire oak tree. So um, we were lucky enough to, uh, to fell this on, on the Castle Howard estate. Um, they grow these as a, as a commercial uh, crop, uh, mainly for, for building purposes, but these are ones that will be eventually um, Yorkshire's first oak barrels going into our whiskey production. So um, at the moment, that's still in that form, but it will end up something very similar to what's behind me in a few years' time, when it's had a chance to dry out and uh, make, a, make a barrel. Yeah, so I'm afraid uh, before we get too many questions asking when we're going to have uh, Yorkshire whiskey made in Yorkshire oak casts, I think this is one that's, this, this is a slow burn, as everything in whiskey is, and it requires a lot of patience. So this is one for the next decade, I think, or maybe the next two decades away. Um, so we've got a couple of other quite nice pictures just whilst we're at this stage of the, um, of the process, which is uh, these guys here, which are some of the ones that we first filled in 2016. Is that right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, and these uh, we decided to go with the the colour on the end. These are what we call our first fill bourbon casks. Um, and the terminology first fill doesn't mean it's the first liquor that's been in it. It means it's the first whisky that's been in it. So uh, these will have a life, um, possibly up to sort of twenty, twenty five, thirty years. So they'll get refilled possibly up to three times. So these are the blue ended ones. Our first fill. Uh, if you ever see a red ended one, that'll be a second fill. And we'll have to think of a colour for third fill. We haven't got that yet. Yeah, it needs to come from the brand colour palette, though. Definitely, we'll make sure it's uh, the old you fits. Well. <laughs> I'll, put that on out. I'll make sure that that works. Maybe a nice copper. <laughs> you kid. Um, and then these guys here. So tell us about these. These are quite excited. This is a nice picture. Yeah, well, you can see the container behind. Uh, that was the first delivery of, um, of, of the uh, American barrels. They, they come from... One of the oldest distilleries actually in America. So it's owned by the same company that uh, have Jack Daniels, the brown foreman. Uh, they're old forester. And um, back in Prohibition, when, when there was only about three uh, distilleries that were allowed to sell whiskey, they weren't allowed to make it, but they were allowed to sell it. So they could only buy, uh, sell the stock they had. Um, and uh, Old Forester was actually one of the first that was allowed to be redistilled when they, they came out of prohibition so we use old forester um a lot of history there but also the fact that they leave their bourbon in the cask for uh, a fair bit longer time than most bourbon so we get more uh, what we call wood soak we get more of that lovely bourbon flavor coming out uh, into our our spirit so um yeah they're, they're really really cracking casks um and each container will hold 212 casks so it's a it's a bit of a job getting them out, to be honest. Yeah, cask delivery day is always quite an exciting day, but also always quite hard work. You need a you need a pretty decent breakfast before those days. Um, okay, so I'll take that picture down. Um, so now we've kind of talked about the wood that's gone into things and, and kind of getting to that cask stage. Um, towards the end, we'll talk about the specific casks that we use here at the distillery and why we choose those casks. They've touched on that with Old Forester, but just before we get into that, there's that crucial kind of mid-stage, which is what happens when the spirit is put into the cask. What's that kind of magical transformation about? Yeah, there's lots of stages that it goes through. And I think we've got a little diagram to pop up there, Jen. It's uh, a great diagram. There you go. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it, along the bottom, obviously, is maturation. That's time and, and, and taste, obviously, up the, up the side. Um, so it starts on, on the left-hand side. And as you see, the... We go through three stages effectively um, and the first stage actually is is losing flavor would you believe it's um the new make is quite metallic it's quite tangy in flavor and the wood gets to work on that straight away and starts to uh, take out those uh, elements uh, undesirable elements so we're losing if you like uh, a little bit of uh, flavor um but it's the right flavor to lose if you like so as as time goes on and, and the maturation process uh, moves on that that red line flattens out um, and after sort of particularly three to five years typically you're at the bottom of that uh, that red curve so now we're starting to go into an active maturation process where the liquid is pulling out all the really positive flavors from from the cask um, interestingly enough uh, the sort of three year mark if you like is is what we would call um, a typical time scale for pot based spirits so 
if it, uh, we, we also, as a lot of you know, have uh, a rectifying column, which will make our spirits a little bit uh, clearer, cleaner, if you like, to start with. So those un undesirable flavors are, are, are less prominent. So uh, we feel we get to the, the, the curve a little bit quicker before, we, you know, before three years. Um, so once we accelerate away, you've got three uh, green lines there. The, the bottom green line, dotted green line, would be when the cask is possibly being filled uh, three or four times and you're losing that activity. So obviously it takes a lot longer. The cask is what we call weak. Um, the upper line is if you had a cask which was, say, new oak, um, ultra, ultra sort of um, uh, filled with, with flavor by activity, it can actually overpower the flavor, over, overpower the spirit, so we end up with a too strong a cask. The green solid line is obviously the ideal, um, so we've got, to, you know, that's why we use used casks, so it allows it that, that period of time to, to grow. Um, and the blue line is, is the other influence, which is our character, uh, the spirit of its, uh, the character of the spirit itself. So the solid one is, is where we want to be. You've got a dotted one that's sort of declining slightly because you can lose um, spirit character. For example, if you use a heavily peated uh, spirit over time, it will get less peaty. So you can lose a little bit of, of the, the sort of distillery character, if you like, through that process. Um, so hopefully that's a little bit of a snapshot into what's happening inside that cask over time. Yeah, great. Right, we've got a couple of comments that have come in that I think fit neatly into this part of the uh, broadcast. So um, this one comes in here, which is why don't they reuse the casks for more bourbon? So why why basically don't American yeah. distilleries just keep keep going with theirs instead of selling them off? Great question. It's legal. <laughs> so uh, the law for bourbon production is it has to be a brand new uh, oak barrel. It cannot be refilled and cannot be reused. Um, and I guess as well, that, that's one of the reasons why um, uh, we use them, because obviously there's a, there was a surplus of these, uh, these casks as they entered them. Um, Scots being Scots and, and Yorkshiremen being Yorkshiremen, we get a cheaper barrel because it's been used once. But actually, we realised that, that that sort of previous occupant, be it bourbon or, or sherry, which we'll go on to in a minute, has a massive influence uh, on the, the character of the spirit as well. So it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. But uh, effectively, the answer is you can't use it more than once for bourbon. Okay. And then we've got another question that's just come in as well, which I think sort of fits neatly in. So does the price of the casks you buy fluctuate much? And do you have casks pre-bought from American and Spanish companies that are still in use, or do you purchase them when they're required? Okay. Um, yes, is a question to, to fluctuation. And the elements of, of price fluctuation is how new the cask is or how old the cask is. Um, so some of the really old ones with a lot of um, use tend to be quite a bit cheaper. Um, the, the newer casks um, are, are more expensive. So that, there's a starting place with that. The size of the cask is a massive influence. Um, and uh, what was the other question there? Sorry. Um, and um, how how early on do you buy them? Do you buy them when they're they're still filled with the bourbon, and then and then you sort of wait till they're finished, and then get them, or do you just buy them as and when? No, um, so it's absolutely fundamental. They're wet, so that means the the freshly bit freshly dumped. So when we order the American barrels, we have to order them um, up to sort of two months in advance, and so they can plan in their production dumping uh, to make sure we get them as fresh as possible. So they're on, a, they're on a boat for around about six weeks, um, but they have a little bit of residual um, spirit moisture in them. So as soon as they land with us, we fill them as quickly as possible. And that's very, very much the case with the Spanish oak because it's so hot out there, they have to be freshly dumped. And uh, literally today, uh, the ones there um, standing up uh, were delivered. And if you pop the bung on those, you just hit by the aromas of freshly, uh, freshly dumped sort of... Um, uh, sherry and uh, we've got um, muscatel and we've got pheno behind us so yeah you, you've got to do it back to back you can't you can't let them dry out yeah so you can't just sit with kind of you can't just buy hundreds of casks in advance and let them sit there's it has to be this ongoing process absolutely yeah and as soon as we've taken the liquid out for a bottling we refill them almost immediately so again keeping that moisture into the wood 